Welcome to the Center for Independent Studies. I'm Oliver Hartwig. I'm a research fellow here at the Center. And today we have a guest from Sweden. We have Niels Karlsson, who is the founding president of Sweden's largest think tank, the Ratio Institute. Welcome to Australia. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Now, as far as I understand, you are here to study Australia's reforms. Aren't you just about 25 years too late for that? <laughs> it started 24 years ago, or 25 years ago, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it has stopped. I don't know. We'll see. But that's uh, the purpose of your visit, isn't it? To find out what's driving I'm gonna, reforms? Sweden and Australia has a similar experience. It's quite interesting. They're on the opposite sides of the globe, antipodal countries. But for the last 25, 30 years, both of these countries have made major liberalizing structural reforms. But I guess and the question then is why? Why and how? That's yes. interesting. Why? Many countries need to do reforms. That's a great need in many European countries, as you know. But Sweden and Australia has, in fact, succeeded in implementing reforms. And that's what interests me. But is it true that reforms always need some kind of tipping point for someone to kick off the reform agenda for some event, for some catastrophe, for some disaster, for a fiscal crisis? to trigger these reforms? I believe that many reforms can be done within an existing framework or an existing cognitive interpretation of what politics is about, what society is about. In Australia, you had what Paul Kelly famously have called the Australian settlement, with a very big role for the state, regulations, very high tariffs, and so on. And the crisis in the 70s triggered a change very high unemployment, very high inflation and so on, no growth for a number of years, triggered a change that, to everyone's surprise, at least to my surprise, was implemented by the Labour Party, not by the Liberal Party or the National Party. Does it really matter who is in government when that crisis point comes? Well, in many countries, reforms aren't implemented, as I just said. But in this country, they were implemented. And I do think that ideas was important. So there was enough people here in Australia who had ideas about what to do, how to do it. But in addition to this, you had a number of politicians who were able to push these reforms through the political system. And that's very impressive and not that usual, actually. So you need ideas, you need politicians, and you probably need some kind of trigger. I remember when Germany, for example, had a winter of five million unemployed, uh, Gerhard Schröder triggered yeah. some welfare reforms. When Britain was going through its winter of discontent, Margaret Thatcher came into power just a few months later. Is it always something that's triggering it? And then you need the right people. You need a crisis or something to trigger these fundamental reforms where, well, the whole model shifts. Australia has a very different model today compared to the model in the 70s or 80s, early 80s. Same thing in Sweden. We have changed the Swedish welfare state in a fundamental way over the last 25 years, and that was triggered by a crisis. But once this change has occurred, it should be possible, and it has been possible, to have continuous reforms. What's happened here, as you indicated earlier, it seems to have stopped. For some reason, the will to improve society, to make the economy more efficient and so on, has for some reason come to halt. And I find that very interesting. Probably because Australians feel pretty well off these days. That may be one reason, but uh, you do have quite high unemployment rates for young people. You do have social problems of various kinds that would need reforms, that's for sure. What's the situation in Sweden then? Do you feel that after 20 years of reform in Sweden there is some kind of reform fatigue setting in that people say, well, this is enough and now we have done our job? In Sweden, the reforms were started by the Social Democrats, similar to the Labour Party here in Australia. Then we had a centre-right government who continued, then the Social Democrats came back, and four years ago we got the centre-right government again. And they are for sure a reform government, so they are still working on it. So in that sense, would you say that Sweden today is a model for other countries in Europe? I think uh, Sweden has a lot more reforms needed to be done, but uh, concerning the ability to implement reforms, I think Sweden definitely is an example. But so is Australia. 
But Sweden in the 1990s probably was even worse in terms of state spending ratios uh, than, for example, Greece or Portugal today. So in that sense, Sweden would have some lessons to teach. We were in a similar situation, actually, in the early 1990s. We had very high public debt, we had very high public expenditures, high unemployment rates and so on. But we managed to get out of that situation. But you and weren't locked in a common currency. That's one of the major differences, of course, that uh, the Swedish krona was, well, was depreciated by, I think, 40% even, you know. Well, and that triggered, nice. of course, a export boom that uh, was very important in the comeback of the Swedish economy. So is that the main difference now between Sweden and the United States? It's one of the differences. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard for Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy uh, to handle their problems without, well, even some kind of default or, uh, well, something has to be done and, and they won't be able to pay it back by, by just making reforms. But they will have to do what's not discussed in us, I think, is the lack of growth in these countries. Uh, it's no problem to have a high debt level, as in the US, for example, when growth come ba comes back, if it comes back. Mm -hmm. You're able to pay it back. But the problem for these economies is that, is that for the last 10, 15 years, there has only, almost been no growth at all, no productivity increases. That needs reforms in order to mm -hmm. handle. So from what I understand, you're doing all of this research for a book project, and that's the theory and practice of economic reform, is that right? It's a book about statecraft, actually. Okay. Uh, how to uh, actually promote reforms. Yeah. So um, when can we expect this book? And will it be available in English? It will be published by Edward Elgar, coming mm -hmm. out next year. Well, then we look forward to that. And um, great to have you here in Australia, and uh, we look forward to reading more of your contributions. Great coming here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And you can check out all the latest uh, research from the Center for Independent Studies on our website. Thank you very much for watching and see you again next time.